All right. So let me welcome you to the November 2014 Forest Connect webinar. This is uh, an introduction to forest ecology in the Northeast. I'll be giving this presentation. I'm Peter Smallage. I'm the New York State Extension Forester, Director of the Arnott Teaching and Research Forest. And I'd like to welcome you all to this presentation. Um, one of the options that we have, uh, that you have, is if you want to uh, keep a PDF copy of this presentation, you can go to the File menu, drop-down menu in the upper left-hand corner, select the option to Save As, select Document, and then select the option to save that as a PDF. You have two options. You can save it as a UCF file type or a PDF file type. You want the PDF file type. You won't be able to open the UCF file type. So with that, let's go ahead and get started. Uh, so this is an introduction to forest ecology. You can imagine that uh, the ecology of the forest is is quite complex. We're going to skim the surface and we're going to flavor the discussion and interpretation of ecological interactions within the context of management. So we'll uh, proceed from here. So we can, we can look at the forest in many different ways, and, and you all have some experience with the forest. Uh, we, we, can, we can think about forests as collections of tree species. We can think about forests as collections of trees and other plants and animals, uh, insect animals and mam mammal animals and bird animals, uh, soil microorganisms. We can think about uh, the, the layering that happens in the forest in terms of a vertical profile from upper canopy to mid canopy to lower canopy. We can think about changes in the forest, changes that happen over decades, over centuries, and even changes that happen from one year to the next, illustrated by the fall color in the lower panel. So all of these are, are components of the ecology of the forest, and uh, we'll be, we'll be um, thinking about them in, in different ways, but this is just to kind of start to get your head around the fact that we're thinking in both very large time scales as well as uh, a variety, well, large and small time scales and large and small spatial scales. So the definition, the classic definition of ecology is that it's the study of the interactions of organisms in their environment. And um, there's some, you know, we always want to ask the why question, why do we want to study the interaction of organisms in their environment? It may just be because we want to know. Uh, this is, and particularly I think, well, I'm trained as a forest ecologist, in my mind you can justify why by saying just to know. But uh, more fundamentally, in, in thinking about the principles of forest ecology, the things that we know will allow us to perhaps influence the interactions that species have. And invariably, as, as managers, we, there are some species that we want to favor and some species that we want to disfavor. So if we can understand those um, interactions and, the, and the, the advantages that some species have over others, we can perhaps influence the outcome in a way that it's uh, more favorable to our desired species. Uh, and, and one thing to kind of add to that is that all these species are going to interact in both among species, uh, so sugar maple to sugar maple, but also sugar maple to other species, plant species and animal species. Um, Within those interactions, there's an, an, at first I said there's always going to you know they're going to have one that's favored and one that's disfavored, and that's not necessarily the case. There may be one that's favored and one that's that's unaffected, or there may be one an interaction where one species actually benefits another species. For example, when you have nitrogen fixing species, that may be to the advantage of other species. So maybe more general way is to think about this is that that the interaction of species is going to produce some kind of a synergy, and uh, there, there may be either positive or negative outcomes to that interaction. 
Um, th these interactions of forest organisms vary, and they vary uh, with landscape history, uh, so how the landscape has changed over time. Uh, they vary with human activity, the things that humans do, and eventually we'll get to uh, the, the final graphic that I have is a kind of a draft um, model, if you will, of how humans might um, intervene in, in the ecological processes of the forest. There are natural processes that we need to think about. Uh, there, there's the way that organisms respond, uh, the attributes that individual organisms have in their environmental conditions. So this is roughly an, an outline of the things that we'll be talking about, at least in the first half of this presentation. Um, and, and then, as I've, as I've said, as decision makers, we, we can have some influence over some of the factors that influence the forest. Certainly not all of them, but knowing where we can have an influence, the timing and the sequence and the intensity of those um, actions that we can put into play will uh, influence the outcome, potentially influence the outcome or the trajectory that that forest uh, proceeds along. So these dominant factors that influence an organism's response to the environment include uh, life history attributes. This is how a species responds. Uh, that's going to be a bit of a backdrop on these other, uh, other characteristics. So we'll be looking at landscape history, light levels, uh, soil and site conditions, wildlife with particular influence um, or attention to deer, and then what I refer to as uh, pests, pathogens, and other episodic events. Um, the, the result of the interaction of, of a species uh, with another species or with the environment is that there may be, uh, it's going to produce some kind of a physical appearance of the forest, and that's what we call the structure. Uh, there's going to be a mix of species, potentially a mix, and maybe it may, there are some circumstances where we have monocultures of species. And usually when I say the word species, I'm talking about plant species. Uh, so we may have a mix of species, and that's the composition. And then through those interactions between species and between a species and its environment, uh, the forest is going to change. Uh, the structure and the composition will change through time. Uh, you all are probably aware of that. Some people uh, who spend less time uh, thinking about and interacting with the forest uh, don't realize that, that the forest changes. It changes you know, subtly from one week to the next, certainly one month or one season to the next, but from one year to the next, the forest will also change, and it changes in response to these interactions. So let's jump right into landscape history, and landscape history is is uh, essentially uh, the, the process of large scale and infrequent events. So we're thinking about very large spatial scales and large temporal scales. And in the Northeast, uh, and this is a, a graphic from New York, uh, but it would be roughly applicable to the Northeast and the East, most of the Eastern United States, we can see changes in the, uh, the composition of the landscape over time. So post-European settlement, land was cleared for agriculture, so this is you know, back in the 1600s and 1700s. Uh, by the middle 1800s, much of the land in New York and the Northeast had been cleared for agriculture. Uh, just as a point of reference, New York has about 30 million acres. So by the peak of agriculture in 1880, uh, agriculture uh, forest had been cleared from all but about six million acres of New York. So the majority of New York was an agricultural state. Since 1880, the number of farms has, dis has decreased and the acreage in farms has decreased. The number of farms has decreased most rapidly, so we have um, aggregation of some of those agricultural lands. Uh, the, the oldest data that I found looking at forested acres goes back to the early 1900s, and that roughly corresponds inversely with the amount of agricultural land. So we, we start off with about six and a half or seven million acres of forest land in New York in the early 1900s, and currently we're at about 18 million acres of forest land in New York. So New York is two-thirds forested. Similar patterns, different details for the northeastern and eastern states. The, the, the point here is that the forest 
originally covered the landscape. That forest was cleared, and then most of that or much of that uh, agricultural land has reverted back to forest. And importantly, these soils, our, our eastern soils and our eastern climates, want to grow forest. So if you if you remove the disturbance patterns, uh, so whether it's it's uh, um, regular annual agricultural production or some kind of a, of a disturbance that prevents woody plants from growing, if that is removed, some kind of, of woody plant will want to grow there. Now there are potentially impediments to that, but those woody plants will want to grow. This is an illustration of that. If you uh, want to, if you're more visual, um, want to see pictures versus graphics, uh, you'll notice, let me see if I can get my pointer going. You'll notice the covered bridge that was present in 1870, and here's the same covered bridge in 1970. So over the span of 100 years, we have this hillside that was originally cleared for agriculture, uh, has now been uh, completely reforested. And then about three years ago, on the south edge of this of this hill, if you will, there was a skitter park. So from 1870, there was there was essentially no forest. Uh, 1970, it was fully forested, and by 2010 or 2012, there were uh, there was logging activity. So the landscape changes, uh, the forest changes, and the opportunities change. So we can think about. Um, uh, the conditions that were the environmental conditions that existed in 1870 on this hillside and uh, how those conditions influenced the species that dominated um, that dominated the forests that now occupy Prots Hill. So there's uh, soil conditions, there's sunlight conditions, there's availability of seed, uh, there's seed predators, there's seed dispersers. So all of these components influence uh, whether or not uh, a forest established, and specifically the kinds of species and the abundances of species that occurred there. Um, equally important is the way this forest is owned and managed. So if we look at New York, and again, this is fairly typical for most of the eastern United States, it's primarily private ownership, and that Private ownership is primarily family ownership versus business ownership. This is these are data from the from about five years ago, uh, but the patterns haven't changed much. And what's relevant here is that the uh, it's the private ownership and individual people who are making decisions on relatively small spatial scales, uh, scales that average about 30 acres in New York. Are, are influencing how these forests will change through time. Uh, one way that these forests have changed through time is to look at the way, uh, this is, a, we'll talk about structure a little bit later, but this is an illustration of changes in forest structure. So if we look at the, whatever the color is there for 1968, kind of a peach color, we see that the seedling and sapling size class, which those are stems that are between one and five inches in diameter, that was the dominant size class of forest stands uh, in the late 60s. Um, there were, uh, by 1980, uh, that the abundance, the number of acres of seedlings and saplings had diminished from about six million acres to about four and a half million acres. But the pole size trees had grown. So there we, we see that in 1968, the pole size was about two and a half million, and we gained about a million and a half up to four million from 1968 to 1980. So this is really just showing what we would intuitively expect that as uh, forests change through time, they're growing and getting bigger. And unless you're recruiting additional acreage into young age classes, the acreage in those young class age classes is going to diminish. So we see this pattern of diminishing uh, acreage of seedlings and saplings and increasing acreage of these larger size class trees. So this is changes that, that are happening at a landscape scale. So these are, these are uh, data collected over New York uh, and the patterns are going to be quite similar, I think, for most of the eastern United States.
so that with with that um, kind of brief overview on landscape history, one of the we can we can think about what changes through time uh, and, and what's different when you have an agricultural landscape versus a forested landscape, and one of the primary changes, environmental variables that change, is the amount of light. And we can think about light both as the quality of light and the quantity of light. And we're going to look at both of these in a little more detail. Uh, light is one of those factors that is, uh, we have the, a, a great opportunity to manipulate. It's also one of those factors that is um, a primary trigger for how species uh, respond and whether or not species are successful. It's, it's an individual species' ability to capture and utilize light that largely determines its success. So let's think first about quantity. So the light quantity is the intensity of light. Uh, it's one of the most important variables in nature because um, at least from a plant's perspective, it's the way they make food. Plants photosynthesize and they need sunlight in order to photosynthesize. Um, and it's, it's uh, the, the availability of light is predictable. We always, we know that, you know, in the summertime, there's going to be long day length and short nights. And that changes as we move into winter. Uh, plants and other biological organisms are cued into that. So sunlight is, is a major determinant of growth and then yield for plants. Uh, plants grow well and photosynthesize well at high levels of sunlight. Uh, photosynthesis, the um, noted here as PHS is photosynthesis, becomes limiting uh, when you're down, when you're below about a third of full sunlight. So as plants have less access to sunlight, their rates of photosynthesis are going to diminish. And when you drop below about a third of full sunlight, the, the, um, the ability of the plant to photosynthesize diminishes. That's important because when we look at the understory, we see that in the understory of a, of a pine stand, uh, the understory plants are going to have 10 to 15 percent of full sunlight, and the understory in a hardwood stand is going to be less than, typically less than 5 percent of full sunlight. So the species that are going to survive in the understory of a pine stand or in the understory of a hardwood stand will need to have the ability to either tolerate low levels of sunlight, well, they'll not, it's not even, they'll need to be able to tolerate low levels of sunlight, or they'll be opportunistic, and if you have a gap that forms because a tree dies or a clump of trees die, then you'll have some plants that are able to uh, opportunistically um, take advantage of that sunlight. So light quantity is important. Equally important is the quality of light. And the quality of light is measured as wavelengths. And the wavelengths are uh, referred to as, well, the wavelengths between 400 and 700 nanometers, this is the blue to red range, is referred to as photosynthetically active radiation, or PAR. So when, when plants have access to sunlight that is photosynthetically active, uh, it's in that particular wavelength. Uh, far red wavelengths are greater than 700 nanometers in length. What happens in a forest, and the picture illustrates a vertical stratification of the forest where you have an upper canopy that occurs, and then a mid canopy, and then a lower canopy, as that sunlight passes through each, uh, sequentially through each layer of the canopy, uh, some of the photosynthetically active radiation is absorbed. So the upper layers will absorb photosynthetically active radiation. As it does that, the red wavelength is removed, and what's favored is the far red wavelength. So it, as, you, as you change that red to far red ratio, where you, where you have less red uh, light and more far red light, you're going to, we, we find that plants have redu reduced germination, increased etiolation. So etiolation is when a, you get a spindly plant, it's like a plant that grows in the dark, and then reduced, reduced leaf areas. So you have both a reduction in the quantity of light, as we just talked about, but also the quality of light. So you have less good light that's available. 
uh, just to, to put this into some real numbers, we can we know that in the uh, canopy, the ratio is something on the order of 1.3. This is red to far red. And as we move into the herbaceous layer, the ratio is on the order of 0 0.3. So it's a pretty fairly significant change in the ratio of red to far red light. So um, the, the light conditions are important. And, and you're probably thinking, well, Given that change, how can anything grow in the understory? Well, the reason why anything can grow in the understory is because plants vary in their shade tolerance. And this is uh, this is a chart that shows changes or differences, not changes, differences in shade tolerance. Uh, for tree species, you could do similar kinds of charts for herbaceous plants or shrubs as well. Uh, this is from a, a book that we wrote a couple of years ago called Northeastern Forest Regeneration Handbook, and you can look that up online. Uh, there, there are three basic categories of shade tolerance. We classify trees as intolerant if they need full sunlight, mid-tolerant or intermediate tolerance if they can grow in partial sunlight, and then tolerant if they can endure uh, shade. It's important to note that this is not... Um, Shade tolerance does not impl imply that a tolerant tree needs shade, but rather that it can tolerate shade. So all trees, almost all trees, will grow well in full sunlight. Some of them will survive. Uh, they won't necessarily thrive, but they will survive under uh, increasing amounts of shade. Uh, this chart also has some... some uh, personification, if you will, of these life history characteristics associated with shade tolerance. So we see the, the intolerant species is described as a high stakes gambler. So these are trees, uh, yellow poplar and aspen and pin cherry that uh, produce lots of seed every year. They're available to take advantage of the disturbance when it happens, um, or they produce uh, lots of seed that remains dormant in the soil in the case of pin cherry and is able to respond and grow quickly when the soil heats up associated with sunlight. Uh, species that are mid-tolerant are described as investors. So these, uh, these are species that, that take advantage, that do well and grow quite quickly in full sunlight, but can survive under moderate amounts of shade. And then we have other species that people you would typically think about as kind of the, the uh, mature forest species. These are species that can survive and reproduce in almost full shade. Uh, they need to have some strategies where they can um, you know, get enough sunlight so that they can survive, uh, but they can, they can endure uh, many years of, of high levels of shade. So these, this is, a, this is a, a, a good characterization of one of the primary life history attributes that influence how a tree species responds. And we can, by, by knowing the shade tolerance of a species, we can know something about how it's going to uh, behave and where it's going to be found and where it's going to be competitive. And where it's going to be competitive is, is within the context of its neighboring trees. Uh, and one way to look at uh, the context of neighboring trees is through this, con this, this principle of crown class. So the crown class is the height of a tree relative to its neighbors. So we have trees that are in the, if we just think very generally about two crown classes, we have the upper crown class, these trees that have uh, full, their crown is fully exposed to sunlight, such as this deciduous tree and such as this coniferous tree. Then we have trees that are in the lower crown class, such as this tree and this tree. So these are trees where uh, they have limited uh, access to direct sunlight, or they may have direct sunlight only on the top of that tree. Uh, you'll notice, of course, that the shape of the crown in large part is a reflection of the crown position of that tree. And if we look at uh, the blue dots, we see these are trees that would be considered upper crown class trees. The C and the D represent co-dominant and dominant trees. 
And then we have trees marked with red uh, that are intermediate and suppressed trees. So if we think back to the previous graphic where we had shade tolerance for intolerant, mid-tolerant, and shade tolerant, we would only find intolerant species, shade intolerant species, in upper crown class positions, uh, at least surviving for very long. Uh, you might find mid-tolerant and shade tolerant species occurring in lower crown class positions. Um, relevant here, this is, this is depicting a forest where all of these trees are essentially the same age. So some of, the, some of the trees have grown much faster. Trees have differential growth rates. Some species will grow very fast. That was the, the um, high stakes gambler analogy that we had with the early successional uh, dominant species. And uh, other species are capable of growing more slowly. So shade tolerance is, is, is played out uh, as crown class. And the bigger the crowns, the more competitive those trees are to capture sunlight. So on any given acre, there's only a fixed amount of sunlight that will arrive on a given acre. And those trees have different abilities to capture and utilize that sunlight. OK, let's jump over to uh, soil and site conditions and with Okay, Brian says, yes, I'm, I apologize. Yes, I meant to say that the uh, intolerant species are only going to be in the upper crown classes. You're correct. So you can look in the, in the lower crown classes. You wouldn't see them. If you do find an intolerant species in the lower crown class, it's probably on its way to uh, mortality. Um, and the example that I commonly see in the Northeast is black cherry. Uh, at least in the eastern and northeastern parts of New York, black cherry is not an overly abundant species. Where it does occur, it occurs on um, only in the upper crown class positions. Uh, and where it, where it becomes overtopped, it usually only survives for a couple of years. Thank you, Brian, for clarifying that. So soil and site, very important um, char uh, uh, characteristics of our land that influence how trees grow. And we can think about both physical properties and chemical properties. We're going to be um, just looking briefly at these. So soil and site, we'll think about soil first. Um, soil is that uh, combination of climate, organisms, parent material, topography, and time. This, is, this, this definition of soil goes back for many decades. And those of you who have had a uh, soils class will remember this from, I think it was Hans Jenny that came up with this um, description of soil. Another way to describe soil is that it is parent material acted upon by climate and organisms modified by topography and changes through time. And the, the process of, of soil development is that it creates layers in the soil. And, and there are ways that we can name these different layers, the O horizon, the A horizon, and they have different attributes. Uh, the O horizon and the A horizon are where we're going to find most of the roots of trees and plants. And so it's these layers that are particularly important in providing uh, mineral nutrition and the correct amount of water for the trees that are growing there. Uh, the soil that was, of course, influenced by lower levels as that parent material weathers. Um, the parent material weathering is going to happen on a slower um, cycle than would changes that happen at the surface of the soil in the O horizon. The O horizon stands for the organic layer. Another way to look at soil and the way soil is characterized by texture is using this um, soil triangle. Um, soil texture in large part determines how much moisture and oxygen are available and then to some extent the amount of nutrients. And you've all heard of soils as being a clay soil or a silt loam soil or a sandy loam soil. So this is a, a graphic and a, and a uh, structure that soil scientists use to describe the texture of a soil. So depending upon the percentage of sand, the percentage of clay, and the percentage of silt, we can classify the texture of the soil. 
We also, though, need to know something about the amount of organic matter and then the pH or the ability of the of the soil, the acidity of the soil. The acidity of, of the soil will influence uh, how well those uh, those soils are going to release different types of minerals. The soil conditions combine with site conditions, which which usually reflect topography, but sometimes will will uh, be a combination of topography and uh, structures within the soil, like um, fragipans or impermeable layers, and create site. So site is the is the aggregate of of soil and topography, and site influences which trees are able to survive and which trees are able to thrive. So trees are able to survive on a fairly wide range of soil and site conditions. Uh, trees are only will thrive or will do particularly well on a much narrower range of soil and site conditions, and and thriving means that a, that a tree species is is occurring on soil conditions uh, for which it is well adapted. And the pictures that I show here in the upper uh, left hand corner, uh, these are these are pictures from a sugar bush, and they are uh, this is one of this is the Cornell University sugar bush. And these two pictures occur about, I'll say, a third of a mile apart. Uh, the picture in the upper left-hand corner is a poorly drained soil. And if you look at the crowns of those trees, you see that there's dieback. You see that those crowns of trees, even when they're exposed to full sunlight, are relatively small. So these sugar maple is a species that is not well suited to poorly drained soils. It doesn't do well there. If we look at sugar maple, though, on soils where it's reasonably well drained, it has adequate moisture, it has adequate mineral nutrition, we see trees that are robust and have large, healthy crowns. So this is just an illustration using sugar maple on two different sites, uh, the importance that site conditions can have on the growth of a species. Uh, so as these species are interacting with other species, uh, in this poorly drained soil, sugar maple is going to be at a competitive disadvantage because it's not well adapted to those poorly drained soils. Other tree species that are, are well adapted to those poorly drained soils are going to be able to better uh, capture sunlight and soil um, nutrients than sugar maple and eventually would um, outcompete the sugar maple. So there are several, as you see the list there on the left, soil texture, the drainage, compaction, organic matter, slope position, and soil organisms all uh, come together to characterize the, the site conditions. Uh, taking this a little bit further, we can look at these soils and create a soil type map. This is a, a soil map for uh, our property in the eastern Adirondacks. Uh, if, if you haven't seen a soil map, if you have a woodlot and you'd like to see the soils for your property, you can go to websoilsurvey.nrcs.usda.gov and um, there's a very nice um, online soil mapping uh, program that you can access for free while well, it's prepaid. So uh, with that, you, you draw in the boundaries of your property, you set that as an area of interest, and then the the computer uh, software will, will uh, delineate for you the different soil types of your property. Uh, each of those soil types, um, and you can, if, we, if you were to zoom in, you would see uh, TUD um, right there, TUF. Um, so that's a Tunbridge uh, soil, the, the third letter, the D and the F usually indicates the amount of slope, and then another soil, the PWD, um, I can't read it, PWC right there, PWD. So these are soils, uh, those are pyrite soils, I think, um, uh, that, that have different uh, slope conditions. So knowing what the soil conditions are, then we can use uh, a summary of the soil types and it will describe 
the expected growth capacity of trees on those particular soils. So this is the soil survey for Essex County, New York. You can see the page number is 997. So these some of these soil surveys are very long. All of this information uh, is available online, I think, for almost uh, all states. Uh, and what we see with this is we see the Tunbridge D, which is Tunbridge, very rocky, uh, and then the D would, would represent a fairly uh, a reasonably steep slope. Uh, and then it, it shows the common trees that occur on, those, on that particular soil, and it shows what's called the site index. So site index is the predicted height of a particular tree at a base age. And in the northeastern and eastern, well, northeastern U.S. and, and uh, lake states, the base age is typically 50 years. So for, for red spruce on a Tunbridge D soil, we would expect that red spruce to be 55 feet tall at 50 years of age. Uh, we would expect northern red oak to be, sorry, to be 45 feet tall at 50 years of age. We would expect northern red oak to be 65 feet tall at 50 years of age. So on, on the same soil, this gives us an, an indication of the types of species that are going to be most productive on that particular soil. So on my Tunbridge D soils, I'm, if I'm interested in growing uh, larger quantities of timber, higher volumes, then I would want to favor those species that have the highest site index or look for those species that have the highest volume of wood fiber. So red pine and eastern white pine are the two that have the highest volume. In terms of the hardwoods, it looks like white ash and northern red oak are the two that would be most favorable. Uh, there's a, another, the, the lime and um, soil type um, uh, also has uh, red spruce, and you can see that it has slightly slower growth of red spruce, 35 feet tall at 50 years compared to the Tunbridge D. So site index uh, reflects the, the combination of soil conditions and site conditions in a, in a practical way that allows us to anticipate which trees are going to perform well. Uh, it also lets us know which trees are maybe not going to perform well. Uh, species that are not listed on this particular chart may or may not have, uh, you'd have to use some other information in order to assess whether or not a tree is going to perform well there. Let's say you wanted to, to establish a uh, European larch plantation, you'd need to find some way to assess European larch relative to these soils. Okay, let's jump over to deer, uh, and I especially want to focus on let's jump to wildlife. I got ahead of myself there. It's a Freudian slip, eh? Uh, we especially want to focus on deer when we think about wildlife. And, and you could have, we could probably have a whole series or six months worth of, worth of webinars looking at different components of wildlife. So uh, because this is an introduction to northeastern forest ecology, I, I wanted to pick a species that was most prominent in its, in its uh, influence on the ecological interaction of trees. And so that, uh, that obvious creature is the white-tailed deer. So first of all, the first thing we need to appreciate about deer is that deer browse selectively. And by that, I mean that they will favor some species uh, and disfavor other species. And that's not different. Um, in principle from most of us when we go to a buffet there are some species that we like and there are some species or some foods that we like and there are some foods that we dislike and so we tend to eat the foods that we like and we tend not to eat the foods that we dislike uh, so the details of this graphic are really not um, pertinent, what it's showing is the changes in the number of stems per unit area uh, over a five-year time span. So we have Semina triloba, which is spice bush, and we can see that that had 
um, a certain number of stems in 2003 and almost double the number of stems in 2008. We can contrast that to Elm, which is Almus, which had a reduction between 2003 and 2008. Uh, Acer Sicarum, sugar maple, which had a precipitous decline between 2003 and 2008. And so this particular study, which was uh, that was written up in the Natural Areas Journal, is, is making the case that in, at this particular location, uh, deer were favoring or preferentially browsing species such as elm and sugar maple, and that uh, created an advantage for spicebush. Uh, the specific patterns may change a little bit uh, from one region to the next and certainly will change depending upon what, uh, what species mixture is available and what other food sources are available in the abundance of deer. But the point is that deer will browse selectively. Um, and, and if we think about that, and we think about our northeastern forests, and if we're, what we're trying to do is anticipate how our forests are going to change through time and develop through time, we need to think about the impacts that deer can have. And if the, if the understory of a forest is a mixture of tree species, uh, and it'll be it'll include species that we we are we place value on that we we would describe as desirable, and maybe some species that are less desirable. Um, deer are going to have an impact by preferentially browsing or selectively browsing some of those species, and the way that that plays out is that deer will eat between six and eight pounds per day fresh weight. Uh, so this is uh, this is what they perform well on. And if we just take an average, we can think that deer are going to eat about seven pounds a day of fresh weight. Now they can eat seven pounds of alfalfa if it's uh, in midsummer and there's farm fields around. If there's no agricultural fields, then deer will need to find other sources for that uh, seven pounds per day. When deer work through the woods, they will snip off the tips of the seedlings. They don't eat the entire seedling, so they'll just eat essentially the terminal bud or the buds on the outsides of the plants. And uh, when you when you go through, if you collect a bunch of the tips of those of those plants, uh, you need about 600 seedling tips or bud tips to make a pound. So you can do the math if we need if a deer needs seven pounds of fresh weight per day and there are 600 seedlings or bud tips per pound, then each deer is going to consume or impact 4,200 seedlings or bud tips per day per deer. And this assumes uh, an important assumption here is that this is if it's the deer is exclusively fed from the forest. So if there's agricultural lands or lawns and gardens, uh, as we see in suburban settings, then those deer are going to have other other sources of food that they can access. So if we just do some rough calculations and say, okay, we'll take uh, seven months of the year when most agricultural fields are covered in snow or are uh, typically not productive, so November through May, seven months, um, a, a single deer is going to impact a slightly over 800,000 seedlings or bud tips per deer per year. And I say year because it's like a, a foraging year in the forest. So if you have one deer, that's not a big deal, uh, but most of us have more than one deer in our areas. And so the impacts of those deer can be quite profound. And keep in mind that because deer are browsing selectively, those 800,000 seedlings are going to be concentrated on uh, the species that deer find most palatable, and they will disfavor eating other species. So as some of those species are uh, are being preferentially browsed, other species are being advantaged. This is So this is a very uh, explicit ecological interaction between two different organisms, deer and plant species, and it, and it shows how uh, one species can disfavor through its interactions, can disfavor one species, allowing another species to be favored. It's not really that different from soil and site conditions, where you have uh, a site condition that favors um, one, or where one species has an advantage and another species has a disadvantage. So um, what we see in New York is that over time, and this is harvest data, there, there are not 
good data, I'm told, that describe the um, the actual numbers of deer. There are models that predict the actual numbers of deer, but as a as a proxy or a surrogate estimate, we can see from the uh, mid 1950s the change in deer harvest, which is uh, typically assumed to reflect uh, changes in the deer population. We can see a steady increase in the abundance of deer. The other numbers that I've heard for New York were that in the early 1900s, there was estimated to be about 20,000 deer in the state of New York, and currently they estimate over a million deer in the state of New York. So very significant when you think about what deer eat the fact that what deer eat is not uh, uniformly uh, applied across all plant species and all tree species, but it's selectively focused on particular species, and then thinking about the impacts that they can have, uh, the impacts are very profound. So if we look at an individual seedling, this is a seedling, a sugar maple seedling, that was that has been uh, repeatedly and heavily browsed. So if you're familiar with sugar maple, you know that it has opposite branching. And if you uh, consume a terminal bud, such as happened here, then the two lateral buds will take over. And then if you, um, you know, and down here we had a terminal bud that was snipped off, and so this lateral bud and this lateral bud took off. So deer come through, and every year they will snip off each of these buds and in fairly short order, these seedlings look like bonsai seedlings. Um, here are pictures of oak, you know, like a sugar maple on the left and red oak on the right, uh, seedlings where deer have been repeatedly browsing them. This is an area that we're trying to regenerate. We've done very good forestry. The silviculture is good. Uh, we have uh, it's, a, it's a shelterwood harvest for those of you uh, familiar with that. So we have a good seed supply. We're regenerating seedlings, but the deer have been uh, significantly browsing these seedlings back. So we're not able to create single-stemmed um, uh, saplings that will produce high-quality saw logs in the future. So this is looking at uh, kind of a, at a close-up scale, if we stand back a little bit and we think about at a larger landscape scale, this is an area in the western Adirondacks on the Tug Hill Plateau. This is a, a research site that um, Paul Curtis and Mike Ashdown and I worked on back in like 2009, and we did some combinations of deer fencing and herbicide treatments to control beach. And what you can see, uh, this kind of clump in the middle is one of the fenced exclosures, and surrounding it is a fern field. So one of the attributes of, of excessive deer browsing is a complete annihilation of all woody stems, uh, pushing the, the forest community to a fern community. So the only place that we are able, and this is, this is an extreme example, but it, it illustrates the impact the deer can have. Interestingly, there's not particularly high high population of deer on this property, uh, but there's nothing else for the deer to eat. There's no agricultural lands, so uh, and most of the forest is mature. So when there is harvesting in, in these fairly small patches, the deer are able to uh, have a fairly profound impact on this on the way these forests look. So this is a this is Kevin Berkler, who's the forest manager, uh, looking at a, um, uh, uh, I don't know what that is, looks like a red maple that was um, heavily browsed. Maybe it's a beech that was heavily browsed. Uh, but, but interestingly, this browsing is happening at shoulder height, and uh, that reflects the, uh, the snowpack. So deer can, will travel across the snowpack uh, and have uh, higher impacts in the winter when they can get higher on, higher on the tree. This is the same picture, better illustrating the fence and how the foliage that comes through the fence has been pruned and above the fence line, the vegetation is well established. So very, very uh, profound impact the deer can have on our forest communities. This is not, I don't want to give the, give the impression this happens universally, but this is an example of, of the extreme impacts the deer can have. So let's move now to uh, the, the last of these. So we think about pests, pathogens, and episodic events. These are 
are things that, that happen to trees. They're almost always bad things. And we talked about deer, and I should, just to back up a little bit, there, there are some positive interactions that forests have with wildlife. And, and the easiest one to think about is the role that pollinators have, uh, pollinators that, that pollinate flowers and uh, allow trees to produce uh, reproductive structures, fruits that allow them to regenerate. Uh, though pest pathogens and episodic events typically are um, negative uh, events that happen in the life of a tree. So these pest pathogens and episodic events create stress for trees. Uh, trees are able to handle single stress events pretty well. So if you have a tree that's, that has a defoliation, one-time defoliation, uh, it's, not a, it's not a big deal as long as that tree was healthy. Uh, if there were uh, previous stressors that had been impacting that tree or, or stress events accumulate or persist through time, then there's an increased risk of mortality. So some examples of stress events, uh, uh, January ice storm back in 1998, many of you are, live in the northeastern part of the country, northern New York and Vermont and New Hampshire and Maine, you'll remember the 1998 ice storm that's pictured in the lower right-hand corner. Uh, the ice storm uh, occurred in early January and large amounts of branch material were stripped from the trees. So those trees that were healthy, they may have lost 50% of their branches and when we look at that as a human, we see it's very dramatic and it's, and it's aesthetically striking from a tree's perspective if it's a single stress event it's not uh, significant in, in their big picture of things. Uh, another example is a June defoliation by forest tent caterpillar. You see the caterpillars on a, on a main a tubing line. Uh, it's a lateral line. Uh, again, a single defoliation by forest tent caterpillar isn't really a big deal. It will slow the growth of the tree. It will reduce the amount of sugar that's in the sap, but a single defoliation event is not uh, usually cause mortality. Uh, problematically, the forest tent caterpillar runs in cycles and it may run three or four years of defoliation, which can be an accumulated stress. And there are other kinds of, of stress events. So if you get uh, significant off-trail off skidding damage or invasive insect species, these are examples of stress. And here are some more. So we have ruts from skidders that sheared through roots or uh, on a farm tractor that, that bumped up against a tree alongside a trail. So these are um, uh, examples of stress that impact a tree. So we can define stress as a condition, an agent, those are the stressors that reduce the normal functioning ability of a tree and decrease its productive capacity. Um, what we want to do is we want to manage stress, reduce stress, uh, and and uh, by doing that, we, we minimize the, the reduction in trees' health and tree productivity, or we want to be able to manage trees so that when stress does happen, and stress is going to happen, uh, those trees are more resilient and they're able to respond to that stress. So you can imagine if you think back to those sugar maples that were growing on that poorly drained site, those are trees that have a, a chronic uh, stress condition. They're predisposed to having an unfavorable response to some secondary stress. So uh, an insect defoliation on that poorly drained sugar bush is going to have a different outcome than an insect defoliation on the well-drained sugar bush. So we've already said stress happens. Um, stress reduces uh, the productivity of a tree. Um, it may shorten the lifespan and it's going to take more effort on our part. So our goals, we want to prevent it, we want to predict if it's going to happen, when it's going to happen, and how much will happen and how long it happens. We need to understand the injury, we need to manage the stress, and we need to minimize the impact. And there's a, there's a good um, discussion of stress within this is in the context of climate change. Um, you see the, the reference there where we talk, where they talk about resistance, resilience, and response. So and I'm noting that I've got about five minutes and I still have many slides to go. So let's kind of scoot through this. Let's summarize here some interim summary key points. 
the trees that are currently present uh, were able to reestablish following agriculture. So there were conditions that occurred following agriculture, high sunlight, in many cases exposed mineral soil, uh, large distances, long distances between trees, so there needed to be some mechanism for the distribution, the dispersal of those seeds, but those the forests eventually reestablished. Each species has a suite of attributes, and we've talked about those. These are life history traits that define the species and predict its response to environmental conditions. So it predicts its palatability, it predicts its ability to grow on, on poorly drained or well-drained soils. Um, it predicts its ability to respond to high levels or low levels of sunlight. And then survival ultimately is the result of being able to capture adequate sunlight, uh, occur on suitable soils, avoid deer, and then tolerate or if not avoid stressors. You know, so one stressor that we haven't even talked about is human activity such as logging. So um, I'm, I'm speaking in very general terms here, but but if you know if logging happens in a way that that a particular species is selectively removed, then the seed source for that particular species is removed with it. So I'm showing two pictures of of um, two different related species. We'll see if anybody's good with their bud identification. You can type in the the species on the left and the species on the right, and you can, for those of you familiar, you'll recognize that these two species uh, represent two very different uh, life history characteristics. One of them is a tree, one of them is a sub canopy tree, uh, the one in, nobody's typing in what these identifications are. Anybody know? All right, the one on the left is a sugar maple, the one on the right is a striped maple. So they're both tolerant of shade. Uh, one of them is preferred, sugar maple is preferred by deer, uh, has a very narrow soil condition that it grows on, um, has different, have different longevities, so different strategies for how they uh, endure and survive in their particular environments. So when we package all those things together, landscape history, human activity, soil conditions, uh, wildlife, pest pathogens, and episodic events, the end result is what we see in the forest. And what we see is the structure, uh, we see the different vertical stratums, strata, and then the composition and canopy closure. So when we think about structure and composition, structure is the size, number, and age of trees. Composition is the mixture of the species. Uh, and these together uh, define each particular stand or management unit. So we can describe a particular section of forest by its structure and by its composition. Uh, from that, we can calculate the value per acre. We can think about potential markets, and we can think about prescriptions to uh, manipulate the forest if that's desired to achieve some um, alternative outcome for the forest. Crown class we've talked about. Uh, the upper crown class uh, typically is where we find trees that are responsive to management activities. These are trees that will um, greatly accelerate in growth if they're provided with more sunlight. Lower crown class trees, this the uh, intermediates and the overtopped trees uh, typically have one-third to one-eighth growth response as the upper canopy trees. The, uh, we, we've talked about how forests change through time. We've talked about the uh, establishment of forests following the cessation of a disturbance. So the picture in the upper left-hand corner was, was a whole tree harvest. Uh, so it's a very, it's a large scale disturbance. The forests that regrow from that are sapling size. Remember we talked about seedlings and saplings as those. And so this is an even aged forest that matures into a pole and uh, large, small saw timber stand and that eventually develops into a large saw timber stand. Now, if there's some subsequent disturbance such as a clear cut or a tornado or a severe windstorm, uh, then we go back to square one and start the process all over again. Uh, if we don't, then this particular forest will go through this process of, um, of a steady state uh, renewal where there are small canopy gaps that allow 
out for individual species, um, individual trees, small clumps of trees to establish. The other way that we think about forest development, uh, particularly in the context of management, is an uneven aged forest structure where, where we have three or more age classes. So this was done through a harvest. This was a group selection where we have a juvenile forest here, seedling, a sapling, and then this is a, a pole to small saw timber stand. Um, so these are two different ways to think about the structure of a forest. Um, the forests change through a process known as forest succession. Following a large-scale disturbance, we have early successional plants, uh, weeds, and grasses. And what these show, it's important, I think, to note that we're, what you're seeing are the dominant vegetation. So you see what dominates early on are weeds and grasses. But there are theories of forest succession that uh, referred to as the initial floristics model, where in this initial phase, all of the trees that will dominate in the mature community have become established here. They're just not expressed as dominance. Uh, the second stage, we have shrubs that dominate. So these are visually most apparent, the young forest and then the mature forest. Now again, if there's a large scale disturbance, this mature forest will revert back to this uh, early successional stage. Without that, this particular ma the mature forest will have a, uh, a process of self-renewal. So just a few examples of stand structure. This is a young hardwood stand. And you can imagine trying to describe or being able to describe or wanting to describe structure and composition so that if you were talking to somebody on the phone or sending them an email and you didn't have a picture, how would you describe this? And, and think about the interactions of species uh, and what this forest is going to look like in the future. Here's a, another uh, picture of a stand structure and composition. Interestingly, these two uh, pictures, this is a, essentially a monoculture of sugar maple. And this is a monoculture of white pine. This is an artificially established white pine stand. Uh, the sugar maple was naturally established. Uh, this is a stand, uh, reflects structure and composition, uh, and it's had some human interaction. This was a stand that was exploitively high graded so that the biggest and best trees were removed uh, and other trees remained. And so we have, again, we have interactions of species with their environment. One species was preferentially exploited. The species that remained are going to be those species that dominate this forest into the future. And then here's just a, a, I think of it as a nice picture of a mixed mature hardwood forest. Uh, we can also uh, think about interactions that happen at uh, particular levels or strata within the forest. This was an area, a management treatment that was done to control the understory. Uh, this creates a change in the sunlight that's available at the soil level, and so this will have uh, opportunities for species that would otherwise um, not be able to survive in the dense shade that we see in the background, now have higher levels of sunlight available in the foreground. So that's a lot of detail, and I realize that. Some of you, and I know some of you that are here, and you're familiar with much of this, and so you can package it all together. I was trying to think about a way to represent this if we, if we uh, want to utilize our knowledge of forest ecology to think about how forests are going to change as, we, as they move forward. So as we, we have a starting point for the forest, we aren't going to go back with the forest. We only go forward with the forest. And so trying to kind of put that into a context where we can understand where that's going to go. So I have, um, I, and I offer this with some trepidation, but um, uh, what I'll say is that I don't think it's, uh, well, I don't know if it's inaccurate or in, inaccurate or not as a model, but what I want you to do, if you see something that strikes you, please let me know. So let's think about this in very much as a draft a model of the forest moving forward. So we start on the left, and we have a history of soils and landscape activities that have created the current forest. And that current forest is impacted by pests, pathogens, and episodic uh, events. Um, deer have played an influence over time. Uh, 
uh, and time also acts on this current forest. So the current forest is going to change. We know that the forest is going to change. The current forest reflects the soil and the history. Um, there will be some amount of disturbance, and that disturbance might be small scale. Uh, as trees compete for sunlight, one tree might die and another tree next to it might thrive. Or it might be a large scale disturbance because of a windstorm or an ice storm um, or something like that. Uh, the disturbances uh, of different scales and frequencies result in the, the visible structure and composition of our current forest. Um, in that current forest, if we have a change in sunlight, given some source of seed is going to produce the next forest. Deer will influence uh, perhaps uh, the current structure and composition. Uh, they're not going to so much eat, eat the seed, but they will eat the seedlings and therefore will have some impact on that next forest. And that next forest uh, will have some combination of desirable and undesirable attributes. So the way I've described this, so we have, you can see the text, the current forest will change, forest reflects soil and history, uh, the forest is acted upon by pests, pathogens, and episodic events over time in the presence of deer. These trees compete for resources. Uh, disturbances will vary, uh, but, but through those disturbances they will alter the structure and composition, and by altering structure and composition will alter the competitive interactions. Um, if there's a change in the light regime, uh, plus uh, assuming that there's available seed, which there usually is, whether it's desirable species or non-desirable species, those seeds will produce the next forest or the seedlings or the saplings that already exist there. Uh, the, 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 the red font I've suggested are options where humans can have intervention. So we're not going to, as you can see, that we're not necessarily going to have intervention on the disturbances, but we may have interventions on the scale and frequency. Uh, we have the potential to intervene in the amount of sunlight and the seeds that are present. So it's these options for human interventions where we uh, hope to be able to influence the balance of desirable and undesirable attributes that are produced um, by the forest. So with that, um, we're done. We're a few minutes over. I appreciate those of you who are able to stick around. And if uh, there are questions, I'm happy to take those questions. I'm going to grab, let me grab the exit survey link. So here's the exit survey link. Uh, please click on that and, uh, and complete that. And if there are questions, I'm happy to take questions. I see that Carl had offered some things. Let's see. He's, he's suggesting that forest management is a holistic approach to achieve success. So forest management is a, I mean, had an interesting interaction with colleagues. Uh, forest management, like any kind of management, whether you're managing a business or you're managing uh, your garden or you're managing your forest. You can, you can implement management principles and practices correctly or incorrectly. Uh, you can do it at a small scale or a large scale. So I'd say in its most general sense, forest management is a holistic approach. I think, I think of forest science, the science of forest management as a holistic approach. And when it's done with that mindset, um, it, it is a useful tool and it's the appropriate tool to achieve success. Joanne says pest path. So you're right. Um, pest pathogens should be positive and negative. Um, well, so insects and microbes are going to have, uh, there are going to be positive uh, conditions associated with, with uh, some insects and some microbes. The, the phrasing of the words pests and pathogens would be typically a negative interaction. And that's, of course, from the perspective of the tree, you know, from the perspective of the pest and the pathogen, pathogen that's very positive things. Right. And, and, and there's implicitly um, in my comments, um, uh, I've identified good or bad. And so 
you know, to, to say that something is good or bad, then you have to say for what context or from whose perspective. So, Joanne, I agree with you on that. Any other questions or comments? All right, well, I want to thank you all for participating. This was, uh, it, it was, it was, uh, oh, does light affect red colored leaves the same way as green? Hmm, I'm not sure. Um, I'd have to look that up. So red colored leaves, so the, the red colored leaves typically are leaves that, uh, that occur in the fall and um, we have basically the red, in the fall we have the reds and the yellows. As I recall, in the red leaves what happens is the plant stops producing chlorophyll and it starts producing anthocyanin, which is a, a different um, is that a chloroplast? Boy, this is going way back in my uh, plant physiology. Maybe there's somebody that's, that's had some <laughs> had some more recent physiology. Uh, so, so you lose the chlorophyll. I don't recall if the anthocyanins allow for photosynthesis. I'd be a little surprised. With the yellows, what happens is that the uh, the chlorophyll is still produced, but it's not produced in the abundance that the um, Xanthoxylums are produced. Is that the right word? So the yellow, whatever the yellow pigment um, chloroplasts are. There we go. Thank you, Brian. So um, the yeah, the, it's like the Japanese have uh, different variants. They must the, those plants must be able to photosynthesize because they survive. Um, whether or not they have um, the same photosynthetic potential as uh, um, a maple, for example, with green leaves. I don't know. I'm, I'm sure that somewhere somebody's done uh, photosynthesis uh, response charts on those different species. So Tom wants to know where I can get more information on your numbers on what deer eat. So, you, so Tom, are those numbers um, like the six to eight pounds and 600 seedlings per pound, those kinds of numbers. Okay, um, that information came from um, I'm drawing a blank. It was, with Penn, it was with Penn State Cooperative Extension, Tim McPherson. Is that right? Somebody in Pennsylvania may remember. Those numbers came from. I'd have to look it up. Um, so I'll tell you what I'll do. I will find some information and I will post that to this web page. So I'll use this web page and I'll put a blog up that has some information about deer and preferential browsing by deer. Um, I know that there, the, this is a high interest area for a lot of people. So. Uh, yes, this webinar has been recorded, and I can turn off the uh, recording. But it will all of these webinars are archived at the Forest Connect channel of uh, YouTube. So Francisco says, what's the first thing a new owner needs to do to the forest or not do? Hmm, I'd say the first thing is to get to know what you have on your property. So make sure you know where your boundaries are and develop a, uh, a management plan so that you can, pri you can prioritize. So you have objectives that you prioritize. You may be interested in wildlife and timber and firewood and recreational access and prioritize those, think about where, 
uh, where in your property you're able to accomplish certain um, certain objectives and where you want to accomplish or in other areas where you may want to accomplish them. So you may have good timber production or poor timber production. Uh, work with a forester to write a written management plan and that management plan will allow you to prioritize a work schedule. And this is a voluntary work schedule, but it says, okay, we're going to start working in the northwest corner and we're going to create wildlife habitat and in the eastern middle we have good soils there and the trees are going to respond well for thinning and so we'll, we'll uh, will allow for the best trees to have full access to sunlight in that east middle portion, things like that. So um, Brian says, classic old but good reference for what wild, wildlife like to eat American. Okay, great. Thank you. So, so Charlie wants to know about strategies for getting seedlings past the deer browse, group selection to flood an area with regeneration. So probably group selection is not big enough to overwhelm the deer. And there are some others, um, Brian may have some thoughts. Uh, the, the pictures that I showed were the, it was the ferns and the fenced area. This was in the western Adirondacks on the Tug Hill and uh, I, I don't believe there's data, but there's at least circumstantial evidence that there, if they put in very large harvests, uh, large is like 100 to 200 acres, that there is uh, that that will overwhelm the deer, and they and they put these in every year so that they're trying to stay ahead of the deer. Uh, most landowners don't have 100 acres that they're going to harvest all at once. Uh, so if you're working on a smaller parcel, then you're probably going to have to reduce the impacts of deer by uh, developing or by um, uh, fencing. So if you have, uh, if you want to put in group selections, then you can do some some group selections, but those will probably need to be fenced. The uh, the other way that you can so. Uh, we actually have a project now where we're looking at two different styles of fencing that's low cost to install. Both of them cost less than a, uh, a dollar per lineal foot to install. Um, and we're looking at, at how effectively they control the impacts of deer on relatively small scales, so a tenth of an acre to a quarter to a half of an acre. So um, let's see here. Francisco says, beavers on the land, are they as bad as deer? Are they good to have? So here, this is the, are, are beavers bad or good? Again, that kind of comes back to what your perspective is. Um, beavers eat trees. Um, they don't wander across the landscape quite to the extent that deer do. So they can have a profound impact near water courses. Uh, if your land and you, I think, Francisco, you said you're from Oswego, so you don't have, most of that is not rugged topography, so if you have relatively low changes in elevation, deer could flood a fairly large area. So you need to look at what their current impact is, and uh, there are some strategies that you can use that will allow beaver to remain. They, their, their dams create wetlands and, and shallow ponds that have benefits for some types of wildlife, but they can also have some negative attributes for some species, some tree species. So you have to, uh, that's going to be a site specific condition. Um, Renee is asking about beaver, are there any beaver spe specific statistics? Um, I don't know of any. There, uh, that, that usually the, the impact of beaver doesn't usually come up as one of those large scale problems. I think that there, if you look around, there are um, uh, resources. If you looked on the internet, to, you know something about controlling beaver damage to forest, you would probably find some some different diagrams. Uh, 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 state and county departments of transportation commonly deal with the presence of beaver who are trying to flood roads, and so there are there are some pretty good structures and some fairly inexpensive strategies that you can use to help uh, limit the impacts of beaver on forests. <clears throat> 
Uh, so Charlie talks about um, conifer branches as slash. Yep, that works. So let me see if I can quickly find a, a picture to show you. Um, picture to show you some of the fencing that we have. I don't know if I can. Give me just a minute. I have lots of pictures. I have to just think about where I have them. Here we are, fence project. All right. They all look like they're sideways. So here's a picture. Let's see what it shows up as on the screen. If it's going to show up. Maybe I can't load a JPEG. So essentially, the um, essentially it, it uses Oh, there it is. All right, so there you'll have to twist your head sideways. Uh, one strategy is to use, neither of them use fence posts. So the biggest cost of fencing is to install fence posts. So these use low value trees uh, and uh, some kind of a batten strip to support the fencing. So one style is an eight strand high tensile fence uh, that's not used with electricity. Uh, it's just used as a physical barrier. Uh, and this can be supplemented with an additional strand either on the inside or outside that gives a three dimension uh, perspective that will that will help limit the impacts of deer. The other style of fence, uh, and this, this style of fence, the, high, the multiple strand high tensile, it takes a longer time to establish. I use two to three times more uh, uh, time to establish then the alternative fence, which has a single strand of wire, and then it uses a black plastic mesh uh, that's supported and attached to that wire. So in that case, the black plastic mesh fence, that high tensile wire supports it and also protects it from falling tree branches. Okay. I've had some comments here, let's see. Uh, seedling sleeves, uh, so those are also called, I think, bud cap protectors. Um, I have a project looking at those for a hardwood seedling plantation with the very small seedlings. I don't think they're going to work. I think they're just, they get weighted down by the snow and bend the seedlings over. They might work if you have some established seedlings that are uh, two or three feet tall and you want to protect the single terminal bud. Uh, you can get the, the uh, these bud caps are produced and utilized primarily in the Pacific Northwest to protect conifers like Douglas fir from elk and deer, uh, so you can buy them there. I've also seen, um, I've seen landowners use um, index cards, uh, stapled to get a pair of index cards placed over the bud, stapled on each side about this time of year so it protects the bud over the winter and then the, the winter snows and spring rains will break apart that uh, index card and allows the bud to expand in the spring. So it's a, it's a labor intensive process uh, but in terms of materials is relatively inexpensive. Dave, yes, although it's windy in, in New York today, so I'm not sure how much luck you would have. All right. Um, yep, thank you, Brian. Posted the exit survey in there, I did as well. So Charlie's using hog ring. I also use hog rings to attach the black plastic. Um, let me see if I can find a picture of the black plastic. Uh, 
Uh, all right, so I found it. It's, I don't know why these are all sideways. Makes it kind of tough to see. So here's the black plastic uh, with a hog ring. That's the hog ring. It's, it's got to rotate your head sideways. So all right, let's see here. So Renee says, what does New York State government attitude towards two thirds of New York being forested? Are they interested in protecting these lands from the deer? Um, yes, they are. So New York State uh, DEC developed a, I don't remember what it was called, forest resource assessment strategy back in 2010. They'll be revising that, I suspect, in the next couple of years. Uh, they recognized then, and there's increasing recognition of the impacts of deer. Uh, New York State DEC is funding research through Cornell University as well as through the College of Environmental Science and Forestry to look at ways to uh, limit the impacts, to, to monitor, um, assess, uh, quantify, and limit the impacts of deer on forests. So it is on their radar. They, do, they also have um, a series of deer citizen task forces that are made up of people who um, buy a wildlife management area who uh, help uh, um, advise the DEC on the bag limits of deer. So you would, and I, I'm not sure I can offer much more than that other than to uh, encourage you to go uh, to contact your local DEC office to, to learn more. And you'd need to talk to both the forestry staff as well as the wildlife staff. So. Well, with this, um, you all have been had some very good questions and very good feedback. The, um, we're about a half an hour over our closing time. We have about half of you still participating. So I want to thank you all for taking time today to listen in and for your comments. And I look forward to having you join us back uh, in December, the third Wednesday of December. We'll be talking about uh, wild, manipulating forests and wildlife habitat biodiversity. So thank you all very much.